all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. On this Monday, protesters gathered throughout Metro Atlanta demanding an end to racism and police brutality. Good evening, I'm Jeff Hollinger. And I'm Cheryl Preheim. As protests continue, so do the growing calls to fund, defund the police. But what does that mean? We're going to break it down for you. And here's Today's a look. protesters gathered throughout Metro Atlanta. Jeff, I'll, t I'll send it to you. All right. Thank you, Cheryl. We are looking right now at the state of emergency, which is going to expire tonight. Governor Kemp is going to allow that. Uh, as we have learned over the past two Fridays, initially, the expectation was to have about 300 National Guardsmen in Atlanta, but that number doubled and then it grew to 1,500 who have been here to ensure that the protests are indeed peaceful and again that will expire and do so tonight governor kemp will be allowing it to do so but uh, on this monday night it has been very very quiet the day also uh, was immersed with some protesting but not a large group of protesters we will have more on that coming up in the minutes ahead here on 11 alive news primetime the protesters and pandemic on voters' minds collectively as they head to the polls tomorrow. Georgia's primary election marks the first of three big election days on the calendar this year. Yet the campaigns have had real trouble getting traction in an area of social distancing. 11 Alive's Doug Richards has more. During a Black Lives Matter rally Sunday outside a downtown church, it would have been easy to overlook the masked face of former congressional candidate John Ossoff. He is now running for the U.S. Senate, but his personal appearances like this one have all but vanished in an era of social distancing. It was great to get outdoors uh, with the people, but um, we know we're continuing to be cautious and put public health above all. Which means Ossoff and his biggest challengers, former Columbus Mayor Teresa Tomlinson and former Lieutenant Governor candidate Sarah Riggs Amico have been mostly relegated to virtual town halls, social media appearances, and of course, TV commercials. I certainly feel like something's missing because I have a good handshake <laughs> and uh, I am, uh, you know, born and raised in Georgia. So I love to, uh, you know, slap people on the shoulder and, um, you know, just interact with people. And so I miss that. I miss that very, very much. Yet in some ways, it's never been a better time for Democrats to run for office. The pandemic has reignited debates over the health care system. And more than a week of street protests have given voters a stark new look at criminal justice reform and race relations. Both issues have resonated in the last few weeks of the U.S. Senate campaign, 
even if the Democrats running, have been limited in their face-to-face -face exposure to voters. I think it's one of the most important dynamics we're going to see, not just in the election tomorrow, but in our country's history. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, we know many of you have requested an absentee ballot for the primary. But to make sure your vote counts, there are a couple of things you need to know. You have until Tuesday at 7 p.m. for your absentee ballot to be received. If you haven't mailed it already, you can drop it off in ballot boxes at polling places. But again, the deadline is 7 p.m. tomorrow. If you're not sure if you're registered, you can check your status on the Secretary of State's website. For a link to that and our full election guide, you can text the word poll to 404-885-7600. Remember to text, don't call. You can also count on 11 Alive's Decision 2020 team throughout this important election year to bring you perspective on the issues impacting your life, like the economy and health care. We're talking about some uh, changes as we head into this evening, and we're seeing the showers and storms coming in around this tropical depression that was Cristobal. It's still called Tropical Depression Cristobal, and it is moving to the north, but all that moisture is being drugged off of the Gulf of Mexico and up and over our state. So that's causing some thunderstorms to pop up. So the change is going to be in terms of our humidity. It is going to be on the rise, and we have that threat for thunder Storms. And this is the nature of tropical bands like this. Notice there is a tornado warning right now in northern Alabama, and that is moving to the north. So we still have to watch these cells very carefully, as just at any minute they could strengthen and we could see something develop very, very quickly. So, what we're looking at right now is a few downpours here moving in towards Cedartown with a lot of lightning, also moving in towards Peachtree City, another round of some showers, and into Athens we go. Where they've had some very heavy downpours. Right now, you can see they have some breaks in the action, but the camera lens is still wet from what we saw earlier. And we're going to continue to see this rain move in off and on and becoming more widespread Tuesday into Wednesday. We'll have more on the severe threat we could face coming up as well. Samantha, thanks a lot. A Facebook post from the Johns. Pl Creek police chief is gaining a lot of attention online. He called out some faith leaders. He said he was writing from the perspective of a police officer and a pastor for 25 years. He says, in his opinion, some faith leaders are encouraging violence against police by supporting the Black Lives Matters movement. Here's Caitlin Ross. Police Chief Chris Byers told me he's speaking from his own personal experience and made the post on his own personal Facebook page. He says he was disturbed after seeing some posts calling for violence against law enforcement officers after the death of George Floyd. In his Facebook post, he says he disavows the officers charged in Floyd's death and fully believes racism was at its core. But he says he can't support a movement that he feels condones violence against police officers. He wrote, within his own department, his officers have felt let down by faith leaders who have supported Black Lives Matter in their sermons. Local faith leaders told us, just as the police chief wants people to understand that most police officers want peace and unity, so do most people supporting the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm asking him to give us the same chance that he's asking of us to give to police officers, right? So he, he wants Black Lives Matter folks and people who use that hashtag to see police officers as individuals um, and who care and want to fight racism. And I'm inviting him to see those of us who use the hashtag Black Lives Matter as individuals who care and want to end racism. The police chief didn't want to speak on camera about the post, in a sense taken it down, but says he was encouraged by what Reverend Jackson had to say. Caitlin, thanks a lot. Georgia Power and another of, um, number of other Georgia-based companies, big companies, are now pushing for the Georgia General Assembly to pass hate crime legislation in our state. Georgia Power, Home Depot, UPS, Coca-Cola, and a number of other companies, executives, have signed a letter asking the state legislature to take action by passing House Bill 426. It is a comprehensive hate crime bill. In a statement, Georgia Power says racism of any kind has no place in our communities and that the companies are committed to help make our communities better for all. The Senate is expected to reconvene its session next Monday. An Atlanta native came up with the idea of opening a gathering spot to build community connections. The spot was forced to shut down during the pandemic, but its doors now are wide open. Here's Elvin Lopez. 
This moment is, is one of those moments where we can really make a meaningful difference. Ryan Wilson is the co-founder of The Gathering Spot. It's a business that's centered around people, around bringing people together. He addressed protesters fighting against racial injustice in front of Atlanta's historic Big Bethel AME Church. Streets like these will return to even greater prominence when we support one another. Support is at the center of what Wilson is doing for Black-owned businesses. We've created funds, we've connected people uh, to one another, and overall try to keep folks encouraged during this time. During a time where this global pandemic has affected Black Americans the most. Black folks have been disproportionately impacted in every way that you can think of related to the virus. In health disparities, that's in businesses that are impacted. It's uh, on folks that are essential workers. He says one way to be supportive is to be a customer, but to make a lasting impact, partnerships with both public and private entities is also crucial. If we want the city to win in the long term, we got to think about the systemic issues that we need to change and address that really will allow us long term to win here. As protests continue, some want police departments defunded. We break down what that means coming up next. And don't forget, we are streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. You can subscribe and join in on the conversation in the community section. We have more 11 Alive news in prime time right after the break. When you are sick, cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say On both the federal and state levels, lawmakers are introducing a bill to reform policing. Joe Hankey is tracking the bill that could change police departments in your community. In Washington, D.C. this morning, Democrats from both the House and Senate introduced the Justice and Policing Act. It's a direct response to protests here in Atlanta and nationwide calling for reforms to policing. The power of this movement will help move Congress to act, to pass legislation that not only holds police accountable and increases transparency, but assists police departments to change the culture. Congressional Black Caucus Chairwoman Karen Bass of California played a key role in crafting the act. The caucus reports 201 Democrats Democrats in Congress support the bill, including Georgia representatives John Lewis, Sanford Bishop, Hank Johnson, Lucy McBath, and David Scott. The bill, in part, would ban chokeholds following the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis and ban no-knock warrants in drug cases, as used in the fatal shooting of Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky in March. A national police misconduct registry would be created to stop, quote, problematic officers from leaving one department and joining another without accountability. 
Police departments would also be required to report use of force data to the federal government. State Representative Renita Shannon earlier this year introduced House Bill 636 at the state capitol as she works to create a Georgia use of force database. There is no type of mandatory tracking of police force required. Most of it is voluntary, even if you look at the federal level. Shannon says she also plans to soon introduce a bill aimed at ending citizens' arrests, which she said is being used as a defense in the Ahmad Arbery case and the 2019 death of 62-year-old Kenneth Herring in Clinton County, with 21-year-old Hannah Payne charged with his murder. Shannon says she is hopeful her use of force bill will move forward during the current state legislative session and she supports calls for a similar database by federal lawmakers. I also hope that the bill would include exactly who force is being used on and which officers are using force most often because I do know that what the FBI currently tracks doesn't have a lot of identifying information so um, it's still hard to track which officers are repeatedly using force calls to defund the police. But what exactly does that mean? Well, it really depends on who you ask. Some activists are asking cities to slash the budgets of local police departments. The money can then be reallocated to different parts of the community and to social services. However, others want funding to be eliminated completely, saying communities of color often do not feel protected by police and they rely more on community services to stay safe. Opponents find the idea, quote, radical, but some cities are really starting to consider it. A majority of Minneapolis city council members say they do plan to vote to disband the existing police department. They want to replace it with a community-oriented public safety program and outreach resources. So far, we've not heard any calls to defund any police departments around Metro Atlanta. We are Lebanon Live Storm Trackers tracking the heat and humidity and some of the thunderstorms that are popping up as a result of what is left of Cristobal. It is a tropical depression moving through Arkansas right now with uh, max sustained winds at 35 miles per hour, but copious amounts of rain moving to the north at 18. So it's picked up its pace from where it was uh, pretty much its entire lifespan. It was a slow mover, but now it's moving quickly. It'll move into the western Great Lakes, but some of the moisture from the system will get pushed over us. It's already been bringing in a lot of very rich air, uh, rich in moisture, uh, coming in off the Gulf of Mexico tonight. So that has helped spawn some thunderstorms. We're basically in the outer edges of these outer bands of that former tropical storm and it did cause some severe weather over here in northern Alabama. There was a tornado warning on this cell that's south of Huntsville. It looks like that warning has expired. So we're going to have to watch these carefully because they can become very strong very quickly as the atmosphere is very unstable in these outer bands. Cedartown getting a thunderstorm there. Athens also saw some very heavy downpours earlier and then over here in Rome get ready. It looks like you could see some of the heavy rain Rain and lightning moving in very shortly as well. And your skies certainly look uh, like it will be heading in shortly. Your winds are picking up. The, the clouds are heavy with moisture and dark on the bottom. So we're looking at 87 for a high in Rome today. Hot and humid. Uh, 86 in Covington. 89 in Athens and 88 in Eatonton. The next 12 hours, rain chances are slim because it's going to be very isolated in nature. So will it hit the airport? Well, uh, probably not real likely, except that one cell that's coming through Peachtree City right now. It could possibly hold together. And then as we head through the day tomorrow, we'll see those rain chances going up and then into Wednesday up even more. So as far as those chances for severe tomorrow, they're going to be much like today. There may be some isolated severe storms, but in general, general thunderstorms. And then we have a marginal risk as we head into Wednesday. That's a level one out of five levels, and that's all across North Georgia because the frontal system is going to be moving and lifting up that moisture, and that could make some of the storms stronger. So here's what we're expecting tonight, just some very isolated downpours and showers with some isolated heavy downpours moving in through Rome potentially here. As we get into the rest of uh, tomorrow, I should say rest of tonight and into tomorrow, We'll end up seeing those showers and storms becoming more numerous than they were today. And then as we get into Wednesday, we're looking at more widespread showers and storms. This is Wednesday during the morning and then during the afternoon and evening. And that frontal system approaches, we'll likely see some strong to severe storms continue here. So 50% chance tomorrow, 70% chance 
on our Wednesday. That's going to be the most active day of the week. And then that frontal system moves in behind the moisture, sweeps it away for a very nice end to the week. And it looks like right now a pretty incredible weekend ahead. And this weekend, live sports resumed in Atlanta for the first time since mid-March when the pandemic hit. Fans hope NASCAR is just the beginning of more events. And this stretch without sports has been anything but normal. The most surreal 24 hours of sports that I have ever seen. The entire sports world has been turned upside down because of the coronavirus. The NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL, and Major League Soccer have all suspended their seasons. The Final Four went from fans to no fans to no Final Four. How much did you spend getting ready for the Final Four? Uh, just a little over $4 million. On a normal game day, Charlene Hines' parking lot is almost always full. I'm going to be put out nose if I don't pay my rent for next month. I, I don't know what to do. Man, the house is on fire. Foster is a warehouse supervisor at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. I have to rebuild it. It's hard to impact on the people that work there. You know, it's horrifying. We thrive off of people being able to congregate. Well, my name's Christina Ale. I am an emergency nurse, trauma nurse. Heard a lot that I couldn't see my family. They live in Tennessee. The postponement of the 2020 Olympics is imminent. It's completely we've all just been in limbo about like, you know, what should we do? A lot of people, if they're missing meets, you know, and they don't get those funds. Braves country needs help, and the Braves are answering the call. We're on target to do about 43,000 meals over the course of the next, over the course of the week. We're using the capacity at Mercedes-Benz Stadium for good. Thousands of pounds of food intended for the Final Four has already been sent to homeless shelters. Oh my God! Yeah! And to kind of Zoom bomb this uh, this meeting just to say thank you. Two weeks after break has uh, he's been paying, paying people's salary for everybody in the building. I said walk with me. Come on, come on, come on. Thank you. Let's go. Yes, the cops are walking with us. A Georgia Tech football player in this great city doing something positive for our community. Uh, you know, I, I thought it was powerful. It's not just going to take just me. It's not just going to take just you. It's all of us coming together. Sports are always coming at the right time. Even though we have sports to bring us together, uh, we still can't forget and we still have to make action towards what the final goal is, and that's human rights for everyone. masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Georgia's primary is tomorrow, but due to the coronavirus pandemic, voting looks a little bit different this year, although hundreds lined up for the last day of early voting on Friday. According to the Secretary of State, more than 800,000 Georgians have mailed in their ballots. Joining us is 11 Alive political analyst Dr. Andra Gillespie and Mike Assinger. Good evening to both of you. Mike, we begin with you. COVID-19 providing unprecedented challenges to this year's election. Yes, it has. It's going to be a lot more reliant on uh, mail-in voting. Obviously, we've seen huge, huge numbers of absentee ballots by mail being sent in, which means that election night results are going to be slower in coming uh, because they will. It takes longer to process those absentee ballots, longer to count them. Uh, I think voters are going to see a very different experience in social distancing while waiting in line to cast ballots. Uh, they may see uh, younger and different poll workers who are not their usual sort of um, 65, 75 and older volunteers, but rather um, more motivated young folks um, who will, of course, all be, we hope, wearing masks and lots of hand sanitizer and lots of social distance. And speaking of young people, thousands protesting for racial equality and an end to police brutality in the United States. Dr. Gillespie, what effect do you think that the protests all across America will have on this year's election? I know that's a very sweeping question, but let's try and focus that on what you think it's going to mean in our area. Um, so in the long term, I, I you know, do uh, predict that, especially because of mobilization, um, these young people are going to be encouraged to register to vote and to vote in November. What the immediate term impact is going to be is actually much more uncertain. Um, there is no doubt that there are some people who are brand new to politics who have been um, incensed by what happened to George Floyd, who have now taken to the streets and who have now become politically active and aware. That didn't happen in time for them to register to vote for this election. So we might not see that big impact um, on tomorrow's election, but we could see it if there's a runoff, and I think we will definitely see some impact in November. Mike, one of the big races tomorrow <laughs> is to decide a Democratic Party challenger to David Perdue. What are you looking for as a Republican in terms of that result, and what should Senator Perdue's biggest concern be as we roll toward November? I think the biggest concern facing the Purdue campaign right now is uh, an outright win by one candidate without a need for a primary runoff. Uh, primary runoffs, partisan primary runoffs are usually, and, and I have to put a big caveat on all of these statements now, um, since 2018, um, usually partisan primary runoffs are, the, are decided by the most faithful, the most ardent wing of whichever party. Um, I'm hearing that uh, there is a poll or a recent poll showing that John Ossoff was within one point of winning it outright. Um, he's been in that position before, however. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. But a very strong candidate who uh, wins on the Democratic side um, and takes the nomination can roll momentum all the way through November, and that would worry um, Senator Perdue in a state that's trending towards purple. Dr. Gillespie, if you read anything nationally, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the New York Times, uh, the Dallas newspaper, Chicago, Los Angeles, everybody seems to be in agreement that the Republicans hold on the Senate probably is a tenuous one at this point. As you've taken a look at some numbers, some of your research, what's your view of Democrats flipping one of these Senate seats here in November? Well, it, the national climate um, isn't necessarily the most favorable towards Republicans right now. So we're saying this in June, not knowing exactly what the conditions are going to be in November. And um, nationally, Republicans were more vulnerable this year than they were in 2018 in that there were more Republican held seats that were up. And some of those seats are held up in increasingly competitive states. So the Georgia seats are um, interesting because this state has become more competitive uh, because uh, Donald Trump hasn't done himself in very many favors in the next week. So it's a question of whether or not his coattails are long or short or if they matter at all. And then in the second, 
um, Senate race in particular, uh, you have what looks like it's going to be a three-way race between um, a Democrat and then the two leading Republicans, the incumbent senator who doesn't appear to be very popular, and then a Republican insurgent um, who has a really strong base. And so it's a question of um, if there's a lot of anti-Trump fervor, whether or not Republicans would actually be able to hold on to that second uh, Senate seat in Georgia as well. So all eyes will be on Georgia for those Senate races at the very least. Dr. Andrew Gillespie, Mike Hassinger, thank you very much. We appreciate your observations and your view on what we can expect on the big vote. And we will talk to you Thanks. in the days ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. appreciate the time, Mayor Bottoms. I love your thoughts and observations and feelings now that we are a week and a half into the protests here in the city. Well, you know, I think that what we are witnessing and experiencing really is a transformational movement in this country. And um, I was born after the civil rights movement. So of course, I've read about it. And it is, it's been fascinating to watch this happening in real time not losing sight of the fact that this is about George Floyd and so many others losing their lives. Um, so it's been really interesting to watch this collective anger, frustration, grief um, of the country. But I really believe in my heart of hearts that this is a turning point for us, and I've heard so many people say it who did live through the civil rights movement, that, that this really is not just a reflection point for us as a country, but we, we're, we're, we're changing 
um, before, our, before our eyes. What does it say to you when you look in those crowds of protesters and you see diversity, not just in the way people look, but I've noticed in ages too, from our senior citizens to children who are there with their families? So, you know, it was really interesting. I had a really interesting conversation with my 18 year old and I learned so much from my, my kids. And um, what he said to me, he said, this isn't just about black and white, this is about rich and poor. And I think that really summed it up that this is um, for as, uh, as much as the impetus for this movement has been about racial injustice. I think it's about equity in general, which I think speaks to so many people um, having access to opportunity and quality, quality education and health care and all of these things that create these layers of challenges within our communities and in a and another layer of that is what many believe to be over policing um, in so many communities. And I think it's about so many things, but what's been top of mind for me the entire week have been the words of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. We w wear the mask that grins and lies and hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. So for the first time, I think collectively America is peeling back this mask and we are having these very real conversations about things. I think for some, it's about peeling back the mask and showing the anger and the sadness and the frustration, sometimes in circles and in places that we normally don't do it. And for others, I think it's been about peeling back the mask, saying I've had my head in the sand. Um, and I, and I, I recognize that there are problems in, in my midst that I've never acknowledged this problem. What is your message to protesters as they are out there marching, sharing their message in the midst of an ongoing pandemic? Um, just for me personally, to see the peaceful protest happening, um, it, it is inspiring to me. And that is the spirit of the civil rights movement and the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in this city. And it's certainly a, a, a disruption to to our lives as we know it. Um, but you know, Dr. King was the one who said, "No justice, no peace." And so, and until we can have true justice in this in this country, I think this is our now normal that there is going to be a peaceful disruption in this country, and it, it inspires me, and, and I'm, I'm very I'm glad to see it happening. Would you recommend that the protesters who are active get tested for COVID-19? Absolutely. I took my COVID test this week and uh, I'm sorry, the end of last week, I was um, told I, I should wait a few days and I'm going to actually take another COVID test this week. So I should have my results. Um, they may even be available today. Um, but anyone who's been a part of mass gatherings and even as, as I've been out and uh, going in and out of buildings and in our joint command center, I see that you very easily get back into old habits, habits that you've had your entire life. Um, and, you know, I, I've even caught myself not being as thoughtful about touching something and then washing my hands and all of the things that I've been saying and preaching about the past few months. So, I am going to take another COVID test, and I encourage anyone who's been out in public, especially in large gatherings, to do the same. So you created the Advisory Council to look at use of force policies, and in Minneapolis, the majority of the city council says they support defunding the police. So we've seen a, a lot of different ideas. I'm curious, what is your stance on the idea of def defunding police departments, and what impact would that have to cities and uh, police response. So I'm looking here because on my desk is our city of Atlanta budget. This is a pretty thick book. And I think that a very simplified message is defund the police. But I think the, the overarching theme is that people want to see a reallocation of resources into community development and alternatives to just criminalizing um, responses to behavior. So I think it, it's incumbent upon us to help people articulate that frustration. Um, and so 
even when I look at our budget, the vast majority of our police budget goes to salary, pensions, workers' compensation, capital improvements. But we've cut our corrections budget by 60%, and we are allocating that funding specifically to help with the conversion of our jail to a center of equity, health, and wellness. So on the surface, it, it, it may look like, oh, you just need to slash your police budget. But when in reality, if you, you want those services and you're getting them, you're just getting them from somewhere else in our budget. And I think it's, it, we just have to be very careful simplifying a message that's con that comes in the form of a document that's this big. Um, when we start talking about city budgets. The overall amount, is this correct, Mayor Bottom, 673 million with 12% of it for APD, is that a bigger or smaller percentage than the current fiscal 2020 budget? Do you know those numbers? That sounds right, but let me tell you why the numbers are, are a bit larger for APD, because we did the uh, pay raise for our police officers. And on the surface, many people who have an issue with police take exception with that pay raise. But I, stand, I articulated it then, and I stand by that reasoning now. We don't want our police officers working two and three jobs. We want to have competitive salaries. We don't want them exhausted because they've been working all night somewhere else um, when they come into work on behalf of the city um, because it makes them fatigue. It makes their, their temper a bit shorter and all the things that, that go along with being exhausted. We also want our police officers to be able to afford to live in the city of Atlanta um, so that they can be a part of the communities that they are partnering with. And we need it to be competitive because we don't want the leftovers. We want to be able to, to pick from the best talent pool uh, that's available. And so with that historic police pay increase, um, you, you're seeing it reflected in this budget for the first time, and that by and large is responsible for that increase. Tomorrow is a primary election in Georgia. A lot of people have early voted already or, or sent in their ballot ballots. Do you expect the momentum of the protests to carry into the election season, starting with this primary election and moving into November? I certainly do. I know that we um, it at least appears to have been a high turnout. I haven't seen the numbers yet for early voting, the turnout was steady. I know a lot of precincts were um, consolidated because of COVID. Um, and, and if anything, I think that we've got to get this right for the election in November because we're going to see a lot of people turning out to vote and it's going to be unacceptable for people to have to stand in line for six to eight hours like we saw in some Fulton County precinct. So hopefully the lessons from this election, um, we can tweak or Fulton County and, and the various counties can tweak what needs to be done going into the November election. But I think that people are motivated and I, and I certainly think that's going to carry over past tomorrow. Mayor Bottoms, I think the dinner conversations at your house are, are far more exciting than at my house because um, when you are on the short list and reported to be on a list of vice potential vice presidential candidates for, for Joe Biden, that would be some interesting dinner conversation. What is it like to have your name in, in those conversations? Well, you know, the reality is that we live in a country with 330 plus million people. So to have your name spoken in that light, it's a, it, it is a big deal. And I'm honored to have my name spoken in that way. Um, but the reality is the city of Atlanta has given me more on my plate than I can say gray, grace over. Um, COVID on top of running the city was already a really big deal. And, um, the events over the almost past two weeks on top of COVID, on top of running the city, uh, it, it's a lot to occupy my time with. So I appreciate that my name is spoken in that regard and, and it remains to be seen what happens. I This might feel like a very general question, Mayor, but from where you stand, where do we go from here? I think it's incumbent upon us to to articulate that. And very interestingly uh, enough, last night, my nine-year-old son found Selma, uh, the movie on television, and, and made us all stop and watch it. 
And, you know, what struck me really was the organization of the civil rights movement and this unified voice and, and call for change. So much has changed about who we are as a country, even how, we, how our messages are amplified, whether it be so, social media, print or broadcast, et cetera. And so I don't know if we even have the ability to have one voice to amplify a message, but I do think it's incumbent upon us as leaders to help as best we can people articulate what it is that they want to see. What is, and it's really interesting when I went out into the protest last week and someone said, walk with us. And I said, and then someone said, where are we going? I said, that is the question. Where are we going? And I, I think, um, at least on behalf of the city of Atlanta, we are going to convene a group to try and help us articulate that. And if it is something that's done nationwide, I, I think it's great. But if nothing else, we will at least do it on behalf of our communities. But in the same way that Dr. King and so many others um, between Alabama and, and right here in Atlanta and, and in Georgia began a movement that changed the nation, I, I think that calling is still upon us. Mayor Bottoms, I always really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
A tropical depression, Cristobal, continues to move across Arkansas right now. But look how it continues to spin up these outer bands across the deep south. So we're watching for possible storms to continue and actually increase as we head into the next couple of days. And we've already had some pretty heavy downpours. The air is so laden with moisture that when we see these storms pop, we just get real heavy downpours all at once. Uh, moving into Rome right now, just here on the west side, we have a pretty good downpour at the moment. In fact, as we take a look, I was watching this kind of traverse across the uh, downtown skyline off in the distance, and you can see just how dark and kind of foreboding those clouds are right now. So that's going to be moving in through northwestern Floyd County in the next 15 minutes or so. Also stretching over across I-20. We've had a lot of activity today. It moved through Athens and now it's scooting off to the north. And we're still watching a few here on the west side moving in towards Carroll County once again. And also some that were moving in through uh, right along I-20 dropping some very heavy rain along the interstate there. So it was warm today but seasonal. We were 85 which is right where we should be this time of year. But the difference is our morning low was very mild. 73 degrees and we should be around 67 this time of year. No measurable rain at the airport yet, but we'll likely see that as we head into tomorrow and Wednesday. So overnight tonight, rain chances are slim. You might get some, but it is hit or miss. It is not going to be organized. But come tomorrow, it'll be more organized in nature, and that's when we expect to see an uptick in the chances for rain. So you could have a shower in the morning, but we expect to see more widespread thunderstorm activity during the heat of the day, during the afternoon and evening hours. And it looks like right now uh, the best chance for the strong, the severe storms will come on Wednesday because tomorrow the chances are going to be greatest closer to that center of circulation of that tropical depression. And we'll have a chance for general thunderstorms. So that doesn't mean we can't have a severe storm, but more likely we'll have general thunderstorms that we're used to in the summertime and shouldn't see anything too organized. But more organized activity is expected on Wednesday. We have that marginal risk. That's a level one risk out of five levels for possible severe storms all across North Georgia. But we think best chance will be during the afternoon and evening. We get a little additional heating that adds buoyancy to the atmosphere. And then we can see those heavy downpours and those thunderstorms. So as far as tonight goes, like we said, isolated in nature as we head into the overnight hours on our Monday night night. Once we get into Tuesday morning, we'll end up seeing a few of those showers lingering early on in the early morning hours and then getting into the uh, afternoon is when we really start to see things become more active here with the heating of the day. Troop County could be seeing some storms, Cherokee St County up into Hall County. And then Wednesdays when we'll be watching that front on approach, a shift in the winds. And as that cool air comes in like a steam shovel, it's going to pile up all of this uh, moist air and we'll see some storms forming during the evening hours, some heavy downpours frequent lightning as well as um, some small hail as possible. So we're looking at a 50% chance on our Tuesday, a 70% chance on our Wednesday, and that's the best chance we could see severe storms. And then the front blows through. We dry out Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Look absolutely terrific. And we may even have to raise those 10s up to 11s as we get closer to next weekend. Thanks, Sam. Voting during a pandemic. What is the state doing to make sure tomorrow's primary is safer for voters? Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. 
For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Georgia's primary is tomorrow. It was pushed back, of course, because of the pandemic. Emory University has three tips to share to help you avoid exposure to COVID-19 when you are at the polls. Here's Latasha Givens. During a video briefing, infectious disease physician Dr. Mary Beth Sexton with Emory University gave several tips on how to protect yourself at the poll. She says social distancing is your first line of defense because you do want to try to come as close to, as possible to that six foot distance between people in line. Your second layer of protection, your mask. The mask you've got on probably does protect you a little bit, but mostly it protects everyone around you in line. And then everyone else's mask does the same thing for you. Third, bring your own pen and hand sanitizer with you. If you think you're gonna need a pen to fill out any form, bring your own so that you don't have to touch one that a bunch of other people have touched as well. Bring hand sanitizer with you. And if you do have to touch any common touch surfaces like the table or like a pen and certainly the voting machines themselves, sanitize your hands immediately after and don't touch your face. Dr. Sexton also says if possible, try to vote during less crowded times if you can. Dr. Sexton also says if you voted at a polling location that was very crowded and COVID-19 guidelines were not followed, it is best to get a test a few days later. And for everything else you need to know for tomorrow's elections, head to our website at 11alive.com. Great idea to take your own pen. Thanks, Latasha. It is one of the biggest political events of the year. Tonight, signs Georgia may be in the running to host the RNC. We'll explain when prime time returns. Now for you, get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. 
quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11. Tonight, a reveal investigation into a candidate running for Superior Court judge once fired from the bench before. Tiffany Sellers is on tomorrow's ballot for Fulton County Superior Court judge. About two years ago, she served as the city of South Fulton's first chief magistrate court judge. At the time, it was the first judicial system in the country run by all African-American women. The picture of them together was a viral sensation, but Sellers was fired from her job about a year later. Reveal investigator Andy Parati uncovered a long list of people who claimed the judicial candidate didn't pay her debts in the past. Sure, people make one or two mistakes in their past, but when you've got 10 plus lawsuits and things like that against you, I think you need to get your own house in order before you try to get a job, the job as a judge in a courthouse. I respectfully disagree. You know, I think what we need are we need judges who've lived life. You will hear more from Ms. Sellers and why she believes her legal problems make her the better candidate for the job. That's tonight at 11 on Uplate on our sister station, 11 Alive. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Earlier today, Governor Brian Kemp announced the state of emergency for Georgia National Guard troops to assist during protests expires tonight. This comes after more than a week of nonviolent demonstrations and three days without a citywide curfew or any protest related arrested in Atlanta. And today marks the 11th straight day of protests in our city. Good evening. I'm Cheryl Preheim and I'm Ron Jones and the protests and the pandemic is on the minds of voters as they head to the polls tomorrow in Georgia's primary election. Tomorrow marks the first of three big election days on the calendar this year. However, in an era of social distancing, the campaigns are having trouble getting some traction. 11 Alive's Doug Richards has more. During a Black Lives Matter rally Sunday outside a downtown church, it would have been easy to overlook the masked face of former congressional candidate John Ossoff. He is now running for the U.S. Senate, but his personal appearances like this one have all but vanished in an era of social distancing. It was great to get outdoors uh, with the people, but um, we know we're continuing to be cautious and put public health above all. Which means Ossoff and his biggest challengers, former Columbus Mayor Teresa Tomlinson and former Lieutenant Governor candidate Sarah Riggs Amico have been mostly relegated to virtual town halls, social media appearances, and of course, TV commercials. I certainly feel like something's missing because I have a good handshake <laughs> and uh, I am, uh, you know, born and raised in Georgia. So I love to, uh, you know, slap people on the shoulder and, um, you know, just interact with people. And so I miss that. I miss that very, very much. Yet in some ways, it's never been a better time for Democrats to run for office. The pandemic has reignited debates over the health care system. And more than a week of street protests have given voters a stark new look at criminal justice reform and race relations. Both issues have resonated in the last few weeks of the U.S. Senate campaign, even if the Democrats running have been limited in their face-to-face -face exposure to voters. 
I think it's one of the most important dynamics we're going to see, not just in the election tomorrow, but in our country's history. Well, the hostess city could find itself hosting the nation's Republicans this August. Re representatives for the 2020 Republican National Convention are touring Savannah today. It's one of the cities they're considering if the convention is pulled from Charlotte. President Trump is threatening to move the RNC out of North Carolina because of possible coronavirus restrictions. In response, Governor Brian Kemp has been tweeting out a welcome mat, mat to the president. He joined RNC leaders on the tour today. Other cities under consideration, Orlando, New Orleans, and Dallas. For a link to that and our full election guide, text the word poll to the number you see on your screen, 404-885-7600. And remember to text, do not call. And you can also count on 11 Alive's Decision 2020 team throughout this important election year to bring you perspective on the issues impacting your life, like the economy and health care. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. You see my phone here on your screen because I'm talking to about more than 200 people on Facebook Live right now. We're uh, reading the comments and B Michael Baxter just says, when is the humidity going to end? That's the question everybody wants to know as we have a very humid air mass over us right now, this tropical air mass with a lot of Gulf moisture here. And uh, that's actually kicking up a few showers out there. Not a lot going on around Atlanta. We had some heavier rain that went over Lake Oconee earlier and then that moved up toward the Athens area. It's falling apart as it gets closer to Elberton and closer to uh, uh, Lake Hartwell. Here in Atlanta, we've had just a few spotty showers, some clouds just shaking out a little bit of rain there. Also watching some of these showers that have been right here in Randolph County, Alabama and Cleburne County uh, that are really just at the Georgia line and they kind of skirt up like this one did in the western parts of Floyd County a little bit earlier. That's moving up into Chattooga uh, where we had some heavy rain. That's showing signs of weakening. And then back in Alabama, intense storms earlier. We even had a tornado warning north of Birmingham earlier, but that's moving northward. All of this is kind of circulating around this area of low pressure. This this is Tropical Depression Cristobal, and it's moving up toward the north, but we get these little spiral bands around that, and within those waves, that's where we get some rain that's, uh, that can move through the area. L let me show you what we're watching for the rest of the nighttime hours tonight. We're not not expecting severe weather here, but we are seeing those storms out in Mississippi and Alabama in some of those bands that could turn severe with a level two risk right there on the Mississippi Alabama line level one risk that extends over into much of Alabama. We just have general showers and thunder showers here. Tomorrow severe weather risk goes up to the north, but then once we get into Wednesday, not only with that tropical moisture in place, but a cold front on the way, we're going to see not only our rain chance go up, but also the chance for some stronger storms. I'll break that down for you and show you more of that timing in just a few minutes. Thanks a lot, Chris. A local police chief says that some faith leaders have sowed division during the Black Lives Matter movement. The police chief of Johns Creek says that he wrote on his personal Facebook page from his perspective as both an officer and a pastor of 25 years. Caitlin Ross has his reaction. My first instinct as a faith leader was to just hear the hurt and the sadness and pain that was clearly uh, being expressed in that in that letter. The Reverend Kim Jackson says she knows it's a hard time to be a police officer, but she says the Black Lives Matter movement is not anti-police. Our fundamental objective is to keep lives saved, is to make sure that we all get to go home safely every night. She read the letter written by Johns Creek Police Officer Chris Byers and says she understands he doesn't want to be grouped in with the four officers charged in Floyd's death. Byers writing in his post, he was never one of us. He may have worn a badge, but that's just a hunk of metal without the honor that backs it up. And let me say this, I believe racism was at its core. That's just a part of what it means to represent a larger institution than yourself, right? When people behave, when people misbehave, and they're wearing the same exact kind of uniform that you're wearing, then there, then you have to take some amount of responsibility and culpability for it as well. In the letter, Byers says he does not support the Black Lives Matter movement as it, quote, seems to glorify the killing of my brothers and sisters. But he continues, never give up the fight against racism. We have a long way to go, but we need everyone moving in the same direction. That no matter where we work or what our vocation may be, there are bad apples everywhere. And they misrepresent us. And unfortunately, that misrepresentation goes out to everybody and then unfortunately it builds a narrative that is not true. So what the chief had to say was based upon his emotion and based upon what he had heard and what he had seen. 
But I would like to invite him and anybody else who feel that way to really come to a table and talk to somebody from the movement, listen to their pain, listen to their fears. The police chief didn't want to speak on camera about the post and has since taken it down, but says he was encouraged to hear what these faith leaders have to say. Caitlin, thanks a lot. Georgia Power and some other big name Georgia-based companies are banding together to push the General Assembly in the state to pass hate crime legislation. Georgia Power teaming up with Home Depot, UPS, Coca-Cola. They've signed a letter asking the state's legislature to take action by passing House Bill 426. It's a comprehensive hate crime bill. In a statement, Georgia Power says, racism of any kind has no place in our communities and that the companies are committed to help make our communities better for all. The Senate is expected to reconvene its session next Monday. Following Trayvon Martin's death, an Atlanta native came up with the idea of opening a gathering spot to build community connections. Now, the spot was forced to shut down during the pandemic, but its doors are now reopening following another crisis. Here's Elwin Lopez. This moment is, is one of those moments where we can really make a meaningful difference. Ryan Wilson is the co-founder of The Gathering Spot. It's a business that's centered around people, around bringing people together. He addressed protesters fighting against racial injustice in front of Atlanta's historic Big Bethel AME Church. Streets like these will return to even greater prominence when we support one another. Support is at the center of what Wilson is doing for Black-owned businesses. We've created funds, we've connected people uh, to one another, and overall try to keep folks encouraged during this time. During a time where this global pandemic has affected Black Americans the most. Black folks have been disproportionately impacted in every way that you can think of related to the virus. In health disparities, that's in businesses that are impacted. It's uh, on folks that are essential workers. He says one way to be supportive is to be a customer, but to make a lasting impact, partnerships with both public and private entities is also crucial. If we want the city to win in the long term, we got to think about the systemic issues that we need to change and address that really will allow us long term to win here. As protests continue, some want police departments defunded. We break down what that means next. And don't forget, folks, we are streaming right now on 11 Alive's YouTube channel. Subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. We've got more 11 Alive news prime time after the break. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11. On both the federal and state level, lawmakers are introducing a bill to reform policing. Joe Hinkey is tracking the bill that could change police departments in many communities around the country. 
In Washington, D.C. this morning, Democrats from both the House and Senate introduced the Justice and Policing Act. It's a direct response to protests here in Atlanta and nationwide calling for reforms to policing. The power of this movement will help move Congress to act, to pass legislation that not only holds police accountable and increases transparency, but assists police departments to change the culture. Congressional Black Caucus Chairwoman Karen Bass of California played a key role in crafting the act. The caucus reports 201 Democrats. Democrats in Congress support the bill, including Georgia representatives John Lewis, Sanford Bishop, Hank Johnson, Lucy McBath, and David Scott. The bill, in part, would ban chokeholds following the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis and ban no knock warrants in drug cases, as used in the fatal shooting of Breonna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky, in March. A national police misconduct registry would be created to stop, quote, problematic officers from leaving one department and joining another without accountability. Police departments would also be required to report use of force data to the federal government. State Representative Renita Shannon earlier this year introduced House Bill 636 at the state capitol as she works to create a Georgia use of force database. There is no type of mandatory tracking of police force required. Most of it is voluntary, even if you look at the federal level. Shannon says she also plans to soon introduce a bill aimed at ending citizens' arrests, which she said is being used as a defense in the Ahmad Arbery case and the 2019 death of 62-year-old Kenneth Herring in Clayton County, with 21-year-old Hannah Payne charged with his murder. Shannon says she is hopeful her use of force bill will move forward during the current state legislative session and she supports calls for a similar database by federal lawmakers. I also hope that the bill would include exactly who force is being used on and which officers are using force most often because I do know that what the FBI currently tracks doesn't have a lot of identifying information so um, it's still hard to track which officers are repeatedly using force. Through the protests, there have been calls for police change, police reform, and some calls even to defund police departments. But what does that really mean? It depends on who you ask. Some activists want cities to slash the budgets of their local police departments. The money can then be reallocated to the community and social services. However, others want funding to be eliminated altogether, saying communities of color often do not feel protected by police and rely more on community services to stay safe. In Minneapolis, the majority of the city council members there have said they plan to disband the existing police department, and their plan is to replace it with community-oriented public safety and outreach programs. So far, we have heard no calls to defund any police departments in Metro Atlanta. All right, here we go. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Tracker, still talking with about 150 plus people on Facebook Live right now as um, we're talking about the rain. Just had confirmation from uh, somebody on Facebook Live a second ago about some of the rain that just came through uh, Douglasville. And you can see that there were two waves here, one that came through, then it stopped, and then this next wave is going through right now. The heaviest rain has been over to the east of us so far, uh, over from Lake Oconee up into Athens. Those showers are diminishing as they move up toward the north, toward El Alberton, also toward Lake Hartwell here closer to Atlanta. We'll watch these showers here uh, that are developing in Clayton County right there on the south end of the perimeter. Uh, get a little moderate rain now and that's moving up toward the north. Some of that will move through Atlanta if it holds together. There's, those are the showers I just talked about in Douglasville and then over to the west of us. We had some heavier rain that came through Western Floyd just west of Rome now moving up toward Chattooga. Uh, heavier showers in Cleburne County. That's going to kind of skirt right along the state line, maybe impact Polk and um, also Floyd County in just a little while. And then there's even more rain back into Alabama. These are bands rotating around what is left of Cristobal. It is a tropical depression right now. There's the center of circulation in southern Arkansas. But the counterclockwise flow with this almost makes like these little spiral bands picking up a lot of moisture and then that just feeds into our area. The air is a little more unstable in Alabama and Mississippi and they have had some severe storms there. A little more stable here even though we have some showers. They haven't been too strong. So let me show you what we're watching with that severe weather threat. We kind of touched on this a few minutes ago where tonight that severe weather threat is mainly over to the west of us uh, over in Mississippi and also into Alabama where we see that chance for some uh, stronger storms. It's a slight level two risk and also a level one risk that they have there. Uh, and we're going to have just general showers here tonight. And then tomorrow that thunderstorm risk or severe weather goes mainly up to the north into parts of Tennessee and also into Kentucky. Now, once we get into Wednesday, 
We still have this tropical air mass ahead of a front that's going to come in, and that front might help trigger a few stronger thunderstorms that will roll into our area on uh, Wednesday, where everything in dark green is where we have a marginal or level one of five risks. So we'll keep a close eye on that as those storms move in on Wednesday, where that rain chance is going to be a little bit higher. We're going to go with the five on the wisometer Tuesday, a mild low at 72. It's going to be a muggy morning. Then we get up to 87 in the afternoon with those scattered showers and a few thunder showers that are going to be occurring. Here's a look at how we're going to get this moisture in relation to what's going on with what's left of Cristobal. This is moving up toward the north, all right? And as it does that, I want you to see these arrows here. We still get this southerly flow uh, that will keep pumping in this Gulf moisture into our area. So on Tuesday during the day, mainly late morning or around noontime and just after. That's where we're going to get these scattered showers that will move through some pockets of moderate to heavy rain possible at times. Maybe some thunder and lightning, but at this point we're not overly concerned about a severe weather threat for your Tuesday. It's on Wednesday as we still have this southerly flow. We still have the tropical air mass over us, but then we add in another part of the recipe and that is a cold front. And that's going to be coming in. So ahead of that front, we still have scattered showers that are possible here on Thursday, actually on Wednesday, with that chance that some of those storms could turn strong with that isolated uh, or that risk or just some isolated stronger storms. And then after that front moves through, Look what happens with these arrows and the winds coming in out of the north, and that's going to bring in the drier air. It pushes the rain out, and it not only makes the rain go away, but will also have less humidity or lower humidity with drier air coming in here for the end of the week. So that's one uh, good thing from this. We're going to dry out, and then we'll also see that humidity that's going to go away. So here's the forecast for Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Actually, Tuesday, we have a good chance for some scattered showers. That'll move through at 50%. Then as we head into Wednesday, a better chance for scattered showers and you see that the rain chance or that the uh, wasometer number is going down to a four for Wednesday with highs near 86 degrees. And then as we get into the rest of the period here, we're going to see those scattered showers ending late Wednesday and then we will be dry as we go through the rest of the week and that lower humidity pushing in for Thursday, Friday, end of the weekend. Temperatures though are still going to be hot. We'll be in the mainly the upper 80s through the period, but at least the humidity levels are lower. Monday we'll see just a few more clouds mixing in with the sunshine. And I tell you what, weekend looks great. Thanks a lot, Chris. And speaking of this weekend, live sports resumed in Atlanta for the first time since mid-March when the pandemic pandemic hit. Fans hope NASCAR is just the beginning of more events. This stretch without sports has been anything but normal. The most surreal 24 hours of sports that I have ever seen. The entire sports world has been turned upside down because of the coronavirus. The NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL, and Major League Soccer have all suspended their seasons. The Final Four went from fans to no fans to no Final Four. How much did you spend getting ready for the Final Four? Uh, just a little over $4 million. On a normal game day, Charlene Hines' parking lot is almost always full. I'm going to be put out nose if I don't pay my rent for next month. I, I don't know what to do. Man, my house is on fire. Foster is a warehouse supervisor at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. I have to rebuild it for the impact on the people that work there. You know, it's horrifying. We thrive off of people being able to congregate. My name is Christina Ale. I am an emergency nurse, trauma nurse. Heard a lot that I couldn't see my family. They live in Tennessee. The postponement of the 2020 Olympics is imminent. It's couple weeks we've all just been in limbo about like, you know, what should we do? So a lot of people, if they're missing meets, you know, and they don't get those funds. Braves country needs help, and the Braves are answering the call. We're on target to do about 43,000 meals over the course of the next, over the course of the week. We're using the capacity at Mercedes-Benz Stadium for good. Thousands of pounds of food intended for the Final Four has already been sent to homeless shelters. Oh my God! Yeah! And to kind of Zoom bomb this uh, this meeting just to say thank you. Two weeks off the break has, uh, he's been paying, paying the people's salary for everybody in the video. I said walk with me. Come on, come on, come on. Thank you. Let's go. Yes, the cops are walking with us. A Georgia Tech football player in this great city doing something positive for our community. Uh, and, you know, I, I thought it was powerful. It's not just going to take just me. It's not just going to take just you. It's all of us coming together. Sports are always coming at the right time. Even though we have sports to bring us together, uh, we still can't forget and we still have to make action towards what the final goal is, and that's human rights for everyone.
crystal clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Welcome back, everyone. More than 7 million people around the globe have tested positive for COVID-19 and 400,000 people have died. In Georgia, the number of cases hit more than 52,000 today with more than 2,000 lives lost. And we're asked all the time here, folks, to flip the data and report how many people have actually recovered. Well, the problem is the data is not tracked. But Reveal investigator Re Rebecca Lindstrom has a new perspective that may help you out. I am always asking for more data and more insight on the data that already exists. In one of my open records requests, I received a county breakdown of the number of people who had died at the hospital with COVID-19. The report was generated on May 29th. At the time, there had been about 7,700 hospitalizations. 19% of those patients, 1,446 mothers, fathers, sons and daughters had died. On that same day, Georgia Emergency Management reported 891 active patients. So if you subtract out both of those groups, you end up with 5,397. That number represents recoveries. The number of people who were the most ill went to the hospital for treatment and then went home. This weekend, a nurse reached out to us after she noticed the number of fatalities reported on DPH's daily status report dropped by 14 people. She wanted to know how that was possible. We noticed it too. We track this and dozens of other metrics every day and notice adjustments all of the time. Usually it's a case that gets moved back in time or attributed to another county as DPH learns more. This time a DPH spokesperson says their quality control team found duplicates. In a written statement, she said, we can get the same death reported by more than one source, or sometimes it's a name that was misspelled and resubmitted without being identified as a correction. Many are simply clerical errors. There are a lot of decisions being made using this data, and as frustrated as we get with it, national groups like COVIDTracking.com give Georgia an A for data quality. They say fixing mistakes like this when they're caught is one reason why.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. We still have a few scattered showers out there. A lot of these are diminishing as they move from the south up toward the north, and this is all rotating around the area of low pressure back to the west, which is Tropical Depression Cristobal. Here's what we're watching right now. You can see some of these scattered showers here in our area. In Atlanta, we're okay now, but we're keeping an eye on this cell on the south end of the perimeter coming out of Clayton County into southern DeKalb and central Fulton County. Uh, that's moving up toward the north. Some of those showers are going to hit us here in Atlanta. We have a light shower that is over Cobb County right now that came out of Douglas a little bit earlier. It's weakening and then over the line into Alabama I, on Facebook Live just a few minutes ago, a few folks were saying that they were hearing the thunder uh, over in West Georgia. That's actually from that lightning that's in Cleburne County, Alabama. That's moving to the north. Those showers may skirt uh, parts of uh, Polk County, Harrelson County and Floyd County. Additional showers back into Alabama and then here's the center of circulation. That is Tropical Depression Cristobal that's moving up toward the north. Let's take a look at what we're watching over the next couple of days here as uh, that system is moving up toward the north. It is a tropical depression. It'll keep moving toward the north and away from us, but until uh, we get a cold front that comes through to clean out this tropical moisture, we're going to be dealing with additional scattered showers with the rain chance going up tomorrow and even higher on Wednesday with the potential for some strong thunderstorms around. We'll break that down for you coming up. We really appreciate the time, Mayor Bottoms. I love your thoughts and observations and feelings now that we are a week and a half into the protests here in the city. Well, you know, I think that what we are witnessing and experiencing really is a transformational movement in this country. And um, I was born after the civil rights movement. So of course I've read about it and it is, it's been fascinating to watch this happening in real time not losing sight of the fact that this is about George Floyd and so many others losing their lives. Um, so it's been really interesting to watch this collective anger, frustration, grief um, of the country. But I really believe in my heart of hearts that this is a turning point 
for us. And I've, I've heard so many people say who did live through the civil rights movement that, that this really is not just a reflection point for us as a country, but we, we're, we're, we're changing um, before, our, before our eyes. What does it say to you when you look in those crowds of protesters and you see diversity, not just in the way people look, but I've noticed in ages too, from our senior citizens to children who are there with their families? So, you know, it was really interesting. I had a really interesting conversation with my 18 year old and I learned so much from my, my kids. And um, what he said to me, he said, this isn't just about black and white, this is about rich and poor. And I think that really summed it up that this is um, for as, uh, as much as the impetus for this movement has been about racial injustice. I think it's about equity in general, which I think speaks to so many people um, having access to opportunity and quality, quality education and health care and all of these things that create these layers of challenges within our communities and in a and another layer that is what many t believe to be over policing um, in so many communities. And I think it's about so many things, but what's been top of mind for me the entire week have been the words of Paul Lawrence Dump are, we w wear the mask that grins and lies and hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. So for the first time, I think collectively America is peeling back this mask and we are having these very real conversations about things. I think for some, it's about peeling back the mask and showing the anger and the sadness and the frustration, sometimes in circles and in places that we normally don't do it. And for others, I think it's been about peeling back the mask, saying I've had my head in the sand. Um, and I, and I, I recognize that there are problems in, in my midst that I've never acknowledged this problem. What is your message to protesters as they are out there marching, sharing their message in the midst of an ongoing pandemic? Um, just for me personally, to see the peaceful protest happening, um, it, it is inspiring to me. And that is the spirit of the civil rights movement and the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in this city. And it's certainly a, a, a disruption to to our lives as we know it. Um, but, you know, Dr. King was the one who said no justice, no peace. And so and until we can have true justice in this in this country, I think this is our now normal, that there is going to be a peaceful disruption in this country. And it, it inspires me and, and I'm, I'm very I'm glad to see it happening. Would you recommend that the protesters who are active get tested for COVID-19? Absolutely. I took my COVID test this week and uh, I'm sorry, the end of last week, I was um, told I, I should wait a few days and I'm going to actually take another COVID test this week. So I should have my results. Um, they may even be available today. Um, but anyone who's been a part of mass gatherings and even as, as I've been out and uh, going in and out of buildings and in our joint command center, I see that you very easily get back into old habits, habits that you've had your entire life. Um, and, you know, I, I've even caught myself not being as thoughtful about touching something and then washing my hands and all of the things that I've been saying and preaching about the past few months. So, I am going to take another COVID test and I encourage anyone who's been out in public, especially in large gatherings, to do the same. So you created the advisory council to look at use of force policies. And in Minneapolis, the majority of the city council says they support defunding the police. So we've seen a, a lot of different ideas. I'm curious, what is your stance on the idea of defunding police departments and what impact would that have to cities and uh, police response. So I'm looking here because on my desk is our city of Atlanta budget. This is a pretty thick book. And I think that a very simplified message is defund the police. But I think the, the overarching theme is that people want to see a reallocation of resources into community development and alternatives to just criminalizing um, responses to behavior. So I think 
it, it's incumbent upon us to help people articulate that frustration. Um, and so even when I look at our budget, the vast majority of our police budget goes to salary, pensions, workers' compensation, capital improvements. But we've cut our corrections budget by 60%. And we are allocating that funding specifically to help with the conversion of our jail to a center of equity, health, and wellness. So on the surface, it, it, it may look like, oh, you just need to slash your police budget. But when in reality, if you, you want those services and you're getting them, you're just getting them from somewhere else in our budget. And I think it's, it, we just have to be very careful simplifying a message that's con that comes in the form of a document that's this big um, when we start talking about city budgets. The overall amount, is this correct, Mayor Bottom, 673 million with 12% of it for APD, is that a bigger or smaller percentage than the current fiscal 2020 budget? Do you know those numbers? That sounds right, but it, let me tell you why the numbers are, are a bit larger for APD, because we did the uh, pay raise for our police officers. and. On the surface, many people who have an issue with police take exception with that pay raise, but I, stand, I articulated it then and I stand by that reasoning now. We don't want our police officers working two and three jobs. We want to have competitive salaries. We don't want them exhausted because they've been working all night somewhere else um, when they come into work on behalf of the city um, because it makes them fatigue, it makes their, their temper a bit shorter and all the things that, that go along with being exhausted. We also want our police officers to be able to afford to live in the city of Atlanta um, so that they can be a part of the communities that they are partnering with. And we need it to be competitive because we don't want the leftovers. We want to be able to, to pick from the best talent pool uh, that's available. And so with that historic police pay increase, um, you, you're seeing it reflected in this budget for the first time, and that by and large is responsible for that increase. Tomorrow is a primary election in Georgia. A lot of people have early voted already or, or sent in their ballot ballots. Do you expect the momentum of the protest to carry into the election season, starting with this primary election and moving into November? I certainly do. I know that we um, it at least appears to have been a high turnout. I haven't seen the numbers yet for early voting. The turnout was steady. I know a lot of precincts were um, consolidated because of COVID. Um, and, and if anything, I think that we've got to get this right for the election in November because we're going to see a lot of people turning out to vote. And it's going to be unacceptable for people to have to stand in line for six to eight hours like we saw in some Fulton County precincts. So hopefully the lessons from this election, um, we can tweak or Fulton County and, and the various counties can tweak what needs to be done going into the November election. But I think that people are motivated and I, and I certainly think that's going to carry over past tomorrow. Mayor Bottoms, I think the dinner conversations at your house are, are far more exciting than at my house because um, when you are on the short list and reported to be on a list of vice potential vice presidential candidates for, for Joe Biden, that would be some interesting dinner conversation. What is it like to have your name in, in those conversations? Well, you know, the reality is that we live in a country with 330 plus million people. So to have your name spoken in that light, it's a, it, it is a big deal. And I'm honored to have my name spoken in that way. Um, but the reality is the city of Atlanta has given me more on my plate than I can say gray, grace over. Um, COVID on top of running the city was already a really big deal. And, um, the events over the almost past two weeks on top of COVID, on top of running the city, uh, it, it's a lot to occupy my time with. So I appreciate that my name is spoken in that regard and, and it remains to be seen what happens. I This might feel like a very general question, Mayor, but from where you stand, where do we go from here? I think it's incumbent upon us to to articulate that. And very interestingly uh, enough, last night, my nine-year-old son found Selma 
uh, the movie on television and and made us all stop and watch it. And, you know, what struck me really was the organization of the civil rights movement and this unified voice and, and call for change. So much has changed about who we are as a country, even how, we, how our messages are amplified, whether it be so, social media, print or broadcast, et cetera. And so I don't know if we even have the ability to have one voice to amplify a message, but I do think it's incumbent upon us as leaders to help as best we can people articulate what it is that they want to see. What is, and it's really interesting, when I went out into the protest last week and someone said, walk with us, and I said, and then someone said, where are we going? I said, that is the question. Where are we going? And I, I think, um, at least on behalf of the city of Atlanta, we are going to convene a group to try and help us articulate that. And if it is something that's done nationwide, I, I think it's great. But if nothing else, we will at least do it on behalf of our communities. But in the same way that Dr. King and so many others um, between Alabama and, and right here in Atlanta and, and in Georgia began a movement that changed the nation, I, I think that calling is still upon us. Mayor Bottoms, I always really appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
Well, the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis has triggered protests all around the globe. Demonstrators have called for justice in his case and for stamping out racism and police brutality in their own countries. NBC's Molly Hunter has more from London. Now, the first big solidarity Black Lives Matter protest we saw here in London was a week ago on Sunday. There was another big one on Wednesday in Hyde Park. And since then, we've seen them pop up all over Europe, all over the world, really. Tens of thousands of people out showing solidarity. Now, take a listen to some of the protesters in their words about why they're out on the streets, why the U.S. protests resonate so strongly. This has been happening for years. It's time to stop. We're finished. We're here to protest to say to, that we need to end the racism just today. We have suffered too long in America, and we've suffered too long in Britain with racist policing and killer police. Now, the protests here in the U.K. largely peaceful. There was a slight incident in front of 10 Downing, the prime minister's residence here in London, a little bit of a skirmish. And over the weekend, a monument in Bristol, it's a city just to the west of here, was actually torn down. It was a guy named Edward Colston, a slave trader from the late 1600s, and that statue was actually dumped in the harbor. The health secretary here has warned protesters, though, of course, that coronavirus is still going. We are still in the middle of a pandemic, so he has warned them, please be careful. Uh, of course, something we're talking about both in the States and over here in the UK. We continue to track just a few showers. These are diminishing, though, here in North Georgia, uh, where we've been watching these come out of the south and move toward the north, and some of them were stronger earlier. I'm going to take you in a little bit closer to the Atlanta area, and you can see this right here. In fact, let me step up here. I'm going to zoom in a little bit tighter. I know that's under the word Atlanta. I want to zoom in a little bit tighter so y'all can see this here, where we have some heavy rain that has been coming in from the south. It's inside the perimeter, pretty much crossing right there at the downtown connector and I-20 right there at the state capitol. It's moving up toward the north. It'll keep moving northward here, north of I-20, and then most likely get closer to Buckhead in just a little while. Nothing particularly bad with this. It's not a severe storm or anything, but it just has some heavy rain with it. We haven't seen any lightning with this, but it's possible that we can see some lightning generated out of that as it continues moving to the north. Kind of a small storm, but it does have some heavy rain with it. We've also been watching some of these showers on the west side. They've been kind of hanging out right here along the Georgia-Alabama line. They've been a little heavier in Cleveland County, Alabama and in Randolph County earlier. They're now weakening as they move to the north. We had a little bit of thunder and lightning over in western Floyd County earlier and then even heavier showers and storms back into Alabama. North of Birmingham, we had a tornado warning earlier. Some rotation had developed with one of these storms here, but that moved to the north and it weakened. Another storm kind of firing up right there north and east of Birmingham. So all of this is feeding around what is left of Cristobal. This is now a tropical depression. The center of the circulation is right here in the southern parts of Arkansas. And this flow around it is a counterclockwise flow. And you see that it picks up these bands and just feeds in this moisture from the Gulf of Mexico. And that's where we have these showers developing. There's even a severe thunder storm warning in the eastern parts of Mississippi right now. The air over to the west of us is a little more unstable in Alabama and Mississippi. That's why they have a bigger severe weather threat there compared to where we are here. The trend here is that when these showers develop, they pretty much fall apart. So let me show you what we're watching as we go through the next couple of days with the moisture content in the air. Now take a look at this map where you see the yellows, yellows and oranges. That's where we have very moist air here in our area. It's also been very humid and a tropical rich moisture in our air, and it's going to be that way tomorrow too. And that's going to keep us with some rain chances tomorrow. I think we'll have higher rain chances tomorrow compared to what we had today. And then on Wednesday, we still have all of this moisture feeding in from the Gulf of Mexico and even a better chance for showers. But notice this sharp contrast here with the blues and purples. That's the drier air coming in along with the cold front. And look what happens that sweeps through on Thursday that pushes all the rain down to the south and east. And not only are we going to be rain free Thursday, Friday and into the weekend, but also the humidity levels are going to be a lot lower too. So it's going to give us a nice feel to the air and it looks like that dry air is going to stick with us as we go through the weekend. So here's what we're watching with the humidity levels and the dew points. Whenever Whenever you see these dew points in the lower 70s, it's really oppressive air, but then it gets really comfortable as we get into Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for the end of the week, drying out with the lower humidity and the rain chances going down. But until then, tropical air mass keeping us with the rain chances Tuesday and Wednesday. Storm threat a little higher Wednesday, and then we uh, see the clouds moving out. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, mostly sunny. Highs, though, really warm. It's just not going to be as humid, so it won't feel as muggy out there. And then Monday, a few more clouds build in with temperatures right around 86 for a high. 
Tomorrow is Georgia's primary. It was pushed back, of course, because of COVID-19. Emory University doctors have some suggestions as you go to the polls to try to limit your exposure to coronavirus. Here's Latasha Givens. During a video briefing, infectious disease physician Dr. Mary Beth Sexton with Emory University gave several tips on how to protect yourself at the poll. She says social distancing is your first line of defense. Because you do want to try to come as close to, as possible to that six foot distance between people in line. Your second layer of protection, your mask. The mask you've got on probably does protect you a little bit, but mostly it protects everyone around you in line and then everyone else's mask does the same thing for you. Third, bring your own pen and hand sanitizer with you. If you think you're gonna need a pen to fill out any form, bring your own so that you don't have to touch one that a bunch of other people have touched as well. Bring hand sanitizer with you, and if you do have to touch any common touch surfaces like the table or like a pen, and certainly the voting machines themselves, Sanitize your hands immediately after and don't touch your face. Dr. Sexton also says if possible, try to vote during less crowded times if you can. Dr. Sexton also says if you voted at a polling location that was very crowded and COVID-19 guidelines were not followed, it is best to get a test a few days later. And for everything else you need to know for tomorrow's elections, head to our website at 11alive.com. With people who are sick, avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact. Here's some good news to share on this World Oceans Day. The Georgia Aquarium will open next week after being closed for about three months, but there will be some changes to visitors, of course, because of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. So 
first of all, when you buy a ticket, you'll need to pick a specific time to go. That's gonna help limit the number of people and give staff some time to clean and sanitize. Employees will be required to wear masks and guests will be encouraged to wear masks as well. The aquarium opens to members starting Saturday and it'll open to the general public a week from today. We have more on this and other attractions opening around Atlanta for you on 11alive.com. Ron? Thanks a lot, Cheryl, for joining us on Prime Time. Hey, I'm gonna see you later on Up Late at 11 o'clock on a sister station on 11 Alive. For more news and weather coming up next right here on the ATL, Jeff Hollinger is coming out here to pick it up from now. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, Across the country and here in Metro Atlanta, many protesters want to defund police. So far, City of Atlanta leaders are rejecting the idea, but are willing to talk about making specific police reforms. John Shirick is on that part of the story for us tonight. It is a nationwide campaign with supporters in Atlanta, reformers who want to defund police departments such as the Atlanta Police Department, meaning reduce their budgets, and then spend that money instead on community programs aimed at solving social problems in order to prevent crime in the first place. I'm not saying dismantle the police. I'm saying they do not need millions upon millions of dollars. They have a lot of finances that we can, um, you know, allocate to be beneficial for all communities. But Atlanta's Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms holds 
holding up a copy of the city's budget during an interview with 11 Alive Cheryl Preheim late Monday afternoon. Said there is very little in the police budget that the city could cut. The vast majority of our police budget goes to salary, pensions, workers' compensation, capital improvement. The defund does not mean bring the budget down to zero dollars. Georgia State um, Representative Jasmine the, Clark calling for statewide legislation to reform police and for spending more money on crime prevention. Defund means use those funds in a more a positive manner. Use those funds where they can go to actually help keep our community safe. During an online Atlanta City Council Public Safety Committee meeting, we can't defund the police department. council members who spoke opposed reducing police budgets, while thousands of online petitioners are trying to bring the power of the voters behind their call to decrease the police budget in order to invest in social programs and crime prevention. John Sherrick reporting for us tonight. Now to Decision 2020. Tomorrow, Georgia's long-delayed primary will finally be held. The primary will select candidates who will face off in November's election, but with the likelihood of an August runoff in some races because of the pandemic, fewer voters are allowed inside precincts. There are fewer voting machines in many locations to make sure voters are six feet apart. The pandemic produced a call for voters to use absentee ballots, except in Fulton County. Many voters never got the absentee ballots they applied for, Part of the reason for long lines we saw at early voting sites on Friday. The state election board is investigating that. We're not pleased with the performance of Fulton County. In so many areas, uh, they just made uh, poor decisions. And unfortunately, I know that people are waiting for their absentee ballot, and some will be hoping that it shows up in the mail today so that they can vote and get into the drop box. Candidates and voters have told us interest in the election has been heightened by protests that have churned through Atlanta and around the country since the week before last. Due to coronavirus pandemic, we now know a lot of you have requested absentee ballots for the primary. But to make sure your vote counts, there are a couple of things you need to know. You have until Tuesday at 7 p.m. for your absentee ballot to be received. If you haven't mailed it already, you can drop it off in ballot boxes at polling by, uh, polling places, but again, the deadline is 7 p.m. tomorrow. If you're not sure if you're registered, you can check your status on the Secretary of State's website. It's called the Hostess City, and it could find itself hosting the nation's Republicans this August. Of course, we're talking about Savannah. Representatives for the 2020 Republican National Convention are touring and have been touring today into tonight, according to our sister station, WSAV. It's one of the cities they are considering if the convention is pulled from Charlotte. President Trump is threatening to move the RNC out of North Carolina, saying the state won't guarantee it can be held without coronavirus restrictions. In response, Governor Kemp has been tweeting out the welcome mat to the president. He joined RNC leaders on today's tour. Other cities under consideration include Orlando, New Orleans and Dallas. 11 Alive has you covered on questions about tomorrow's primary. Just text the word poll to 404 885 for a link to our complete voter guide, including candidate profiles, what you need to know about voting in person, and how you can still turn in your absentee ballot. You can also count on 11 Alive's Decision 2020 team throughout this important election year to bring you perspective on the issues impacting your life, like the economy and health care. Tropical depression Cristobal is still on the move. Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb in the Weather Center tracking it for us tonight. Chris, some heavy rain we've been hearing on the roof here in Midtown. Yeah, Jeff, it's interesting. The center of the storm is over in Arkansas right now, but the flow around it is picking up moisture from the Gulf of Mexico and it's sending it our way. And that's why we're seeing some of those scattered showers out there tonight. You mentioned the one that just came over the station. That's right here. It's inside the perimeter, uh, moving right up the downtown connector. It's now north of I-20 and it's now right here at the split between uh, 75 and 85 moving here north in the Buckhead. It'll keep moving up toward the Sandy Springs area and the top end of the perimeter. Uh, it's mainly heavy rain. We do have one lightning strike with that in the past 15 minutes. Not classified as severe, but just some good downpours with that inside the perimeter. Additional showers we've been watching right on the line from Alabama and Georgia. Some of those had heavy rain with thunder and lightning in Cleburne County. That's moving up toward the north as well. We had some showers in Floyd County a little bit earlier with thunder and lightning. And then back into Alabama, the air is a little more unstable, so some of these showers and storms have been a little bit stronger. In fact, we had a um, 
tornado warning earlier uh, north of Birmingham. That's moved to the north and then even more storms back into Mississippi. So here's the rotation or the circulation around that area of low pressure, which is tropical depression. Cristobal It's just picking up all this moisture and and heading it our way. Now, I'm not concerned about a severe weather threat tonight. Let me show you the areas that have that chance for severe storms tonight, and it's right where we're seeing those heavier bands over in Mississippi and then the western parts of Alabama where there's this a marginal risk or level actually a slight risk level two risk. The marginal risk extends to the east of uh, Birmingham. However, we don't really have a severe weather risk for our area tonight. Yeah, some pockets of moderate to heavy rain possible in some isolated areas with rumbles of thunder and flashes of lightning, but nothing really classified as severe. Stay with us. We will see our severe threat coming up a little bit as we get into the middle of the week. We'll talk about what's causing that and when we're finally going to dry out. More on that in just a little bit. Chris, thank you. Two former Atlanta police officers fired after using tasers. On two college students are now suing the police chief and mayor to get their jobs back. The controversial arrest was caught on body camera video during the first weekend of protests near Centennial Olympic Park. It claims the two officers were fired without an investigation, without proper notice, and without pre disciplinary hearing. And with that, they want their jobs restored with back pay. They say they used proper force in the arrest and their firing caused public humiliation. Ivory Streeter and Mark Gardner were fired on May 31st, then later by the district attorney, Paul Howard, for using excessive force. Atlanta Police Chief Erica Shields and Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms reviewed body camera video on the May 30th arrest of the two students, which shows the officers chasing the car driven by Morehouse student Messiah Young. Later, the windows were broken. Guns were drawn on the two students before they were tased and arrested. We were there when that arrest happened. Spelman student Tania Pilgrim told us she did not know why she was being arrested. Chief Shields fired Streeter and Gardner the next day while apologizing for any harm that may have been caused to the students. That's why Mayor Bottoms is included in all of this. Streeter and Gardner say Bottoms said during the news conference that both Bottoms and Shields determined the two officers should be terminated. Four other officers were later charged and arrested. The document alleges those officers also used force, but they were never fired. Instead, they were placed on desk duty by Chief Shields. Georgia Power and a number of Georgia-based companies are pushing for the Georgia General Assembly to pass hate crime legislation. Georgia Power, Home Depot, UPS, Coca-Cola, and more have now signed the letter. They are asking the state legislature to take action by passing House Bill 426, a comprehensive hate crimes bill. In a statement, Georgia Power corporately says racism of any kind has no place in our communities and that the companies are committed to help make our communities better for all. The Senate is expected to reconvene its session next Monday. Atlanta police have released video of a rape suspect they are trying to track down. The incident happened Sunday morning on Juniper Street in Midtown. Investigators say the victim was leaving her apartment complex when the suspect came up to her, then forced her into a vacant apartment. If you know who this man is in the video, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers Atlanta. New tonight at 10, a teen received a surprise while fishing this weekend. He found a loaded gun in a creek in North Buckhead, and that wasn't the only piece of evidence he found in the water. Tracy Amickpeer has the story for us. She said, Mom, I found a gun in the creek. I'm down here fishing. That call, along with this picture, came through on Mary Elizabeth Ellenberg's phone on Sunday evening from her 13-year-old son, Jack. So they called the police and met them at this creek in North Buckhead, right off Ivy Road Northeast. Police say the gun was fully loaded with hollow point bullets, which Ellenberg says makes it even scarier. It was deadly. It was definitely supposed to be used as a lethal weapon. The next day, Ellenberg got another call. Uh, my neighbor called and said, you're not going to believe it, but my children are out at that same creek and they found a backpack and the backpack includes some bullets and we think it might be connected. That backpack was right next to where the gun was found, so police came back out and took it in. Ellenberg says she's not sure where the gun came from, but did mention Georgia 400 crosses right on top of the creek. So it's possible that that gun could have been tossed out of a vehicle, could have come down from 400. She's just glad her son is the one who found it and who knew the right thing to do. 
Right now, that gun and the bullets from the backpack are being held here at the Atlanta Police Department property unit, waiting to be tested at the crime lab. Now, Atlanta police tell me they are looking into whether the gun was thrown off of Georgia 400 into that creek. And due to the condition of the gun, they say it could have been in the creek for weeks or days before it was found. Tracy Amick Pierre reporting for us tonight. Right now, both the gun and the backpack are at the APD property unit waiting to be tested at the crime lab. Police told uh, Tracy tonight that they are looking into the possibility that the gun was thrown from 400, as you have heard. All right, in the wake of the pandemic and racial injustice, one native Atlantan striving to help black owned businesses, how he is doing it. And in the next half hour, the very latest on COVID-19 in Georgia and why the number of deaths recently decreased on the Department of Health's website. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1101 Live News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe. An Atlanta native has come up with the idea of opening a gathering spot to build community connections. Now, the spot was forced to shut down during the pandemic, but its doors are now reopening in the wake of a crisis. Here is Elvin Lopez. This moment is, is one of those moments where we can really make a meaningful difference. Ryan Wilson is the co-founder of The Gathering Spot. It's a business that's centered around people, around bringing people together. He addressed protesters fighting against racial injustice in front of Atlanta's historic Big Bethel AME Church. Streets like these will return to even greater prominence when we support one another. Support is at the center of what Wilson is doing for Black-owned businesses. We've created funds, we've connected people uh, to one another, and overall try to keep folks encouraged during this time. During a time where this global pandemic has affected Black Americans the most. Black folks have been disproportionately impacted in every way that you can think of related to the virus. In health disparities, that's in businesses that are impacted, it's uh, on folks that are essential workers. He says one way to be supportive is to be a customer, but to make a lasting impact, partnerships with both public and private entities is also crucial. If we want the city to win in the long term, we got to think about the systemic issues that we need to change and address that really will allow us long term to win here. Some of you are getting some heavy rain right now inside the perimeter. This is the same cell that just passed over us here at the station. It's small. It's really just inside the perimeter. It's been moving up the downtown connector. Now it's on the north side and you can see it right here between 75 and 85 right there along 41 uh, just north of Buckhead. That's going to continue moving up towards Sandy Springs. It has some heavy rain with it. We did get one lightning strike with it a few minutes ago, so if you heard thunder, that's what it was coming from. From. It's not severe or anything, but it just has some really good heavy rain in association with it. In fact, I'm going to throw something to my uh, director really quick. Um, I think it's Tyrone tonight. 
Uh, if, if we could, in just a second, put up um, remote 56 before I go to the key. I'd like to kind of show the wet roads as these storms just went through. So I'll ask for that in just a second. Thank you, Mighty Tai, for doing that for us. All right, you can see how these showers are moving up toward the north, up 75. And then we have additional showers here. These are the southern parts of Bartow County, uh, right there around Alatoona Lake. And then additional showers here over the uh, near the Alabama-Georgia line. Some of these have been extending over the line into Georgia, but they're weakening as they move through. <laughs> Excuse me, Alabama has had a little more active uh, system coming through. Their air there is a little more stable. These have some thunder and lightning with them north of Birmingham. Uh, we had some showers and storms north of Birmingham earlier that actually triggered a tornado warning. And then even more storms back in the Mississippi. The closer you get to this area of low pressure, this is what is left of Cristobal, which is now a tropical depression that's over Arkansas. And you can see these bands of rain kind of feeding into this. Let's take a look at that tower cam right now. This is that uh, here in Midtown. I wanted to look at this because we just had the heavy rain come through. And you can see that uh, 85 and the Beaufort Highway connector are wet right now from that heavy rain that came through, but at least it has moved up to the north, and that's what's left behind after the system moves through. You've got some wet roads and a lot of puddles on the roadway because it is some heavy rain that's been moving through. I'm not worried about a severe weather threat here tonight. That severe weather threat is going to be over toward the west in the parts of Mississippi and western Alabama where there's that level 2 risk, and then the level 1 risk extends over to Birmingham and just east of Birmingham, but it does, it does not come into our area, so we're not worried about severe weather weather tonight or even tomorrow. I do think we'll have a better rain chance tomorrow, but I don't expect anything to be severe. That severe weather risk moves up to the north along with that area of low pressure. Now we have a tropical air mass here, a lot of moisture, very humid, very muggy, and then we add in a cold front coming through on Wednesday, and so that will give us a chance for some additional lift or some instability, and that'll give us a chance for some isolated storms. We're in that marginal or level one of five risk for isolated severe storms here on your Wednesday. Tomorrow, a five on the wisometer, scattered showers, a couple thunder showers, possible highs near 87 degrees. So here is Cristobal. It moves up to the north, but then from that, notice these arrows here coming out of the south, and that is going to be some very uh, tropical rich moisture coming in here. So we'll see scattered showers developing tomorrow, mainly lunchtime and after. It'll break tomorrow night, and then another round of showers and storms will come in here on Wednesday. As that front comes through, it'll sweep through the area. Watch those winds, how they shift coming out of the north. That pushes the rain out of here and brings in the drier air, meaning that relative humidity level is going to go down for the end of the week too. Scattered showers tomorrow, 50% chance for that. Highs near 87, up to a 70% chance Wednesday. A couple of few storms could be strong with, on Wednesday as well with highs near 86. We clear out on Thursday and then the humidity levels stay low for the end of the week, end of the weekend, beginning of next week too. But it's still going to be warm though. Temperatures are going to be in the upper 80s throughout the period. Take a look at your weather wow moment for today. Look at all that water. Yeah, thanks to Tropical Storm Cristobal making landfall yesterday uh, on the coast of Louisiana and this is video from this morning so still a lot of rain that came through there you can see the heavy rain uh, that even caused some flooding in spots the storm also brought heavy wind to the region things are starting to settle down there now but it's not totally over we have to wait for that storm to lift up to the north before things uh, clear out down along the Gulf Coast we'd love to see your weather wow moment and we get a lot of those locally from our 11 alive community storm trackers uh, and you can be a part of that group it's on Facebook just search 11 alive storm trackers ask to become a member and you can also contribute weather information, weather videos, and weather pictures. Coming up after the break, a local police chief getting a lot of attention on social media for his perspective on Black Lives Matter, why he is calling out faith leaders from Johns Creek tonight. Hi, my name is Valerie, and I'm staying hopeful because I know that in order to make America great, we have to all be able to have equal access to education, homes, and a positive way of life. And if only some have it, then this country will never be great. Thank you. Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. 
There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every Police chief in Johns Creek says faith leaders are sowing division instead of unity during the Black Lives Matter movement. Johns Creek Police Chief Chris Bayer says he wrote the Facebook post on his personal page from his perspective as both an officer and a pastor for 25 years. Here's Caitlin Ross. My first instinct as a faith leader was to just hear the hurt and the sadness and pain that was clearly uh, being expressed in that in that letter. The Reverend Kim Jackson says she knows it's a hard time to be a police officer, but she says the Black Lives Matter movement is not anti-police. Our fundamental objective is to keep lives saved, is to make sure that we all get to go home safely every night. She read the letter written by Johns Creek Police Officer Chris Byers and says she understands he doesn't want to be grouped in with the four officers charged in Floyd's death. Byers writing in his post, he was never one of us. He may have worn a badge, but that's just a hunk of metal without the honor that backs it up. And let me say this, I believe racism was at its core. That's just a part of what it means to represent a larger institution than yourself, right? When people behave, when people misbehave, and they're wearing the same exact kind of uniform that you're wearing, then there, then you have to take some amount of responsibility and culpability for it as well. In the letter, Byers says he does not support the Black Lives Matter movement as it, quote, seems to glorify the killing of my brothers and sisters. But he continues, never give up the fight against racism. We have a long way to go, but we need everyone moving in the same direction. That no matter where we work or what our vocation may be, there are bad apples everywhere. And they misrepresent us. And unfortunately, that misrepresentation goes out to everybody and then unfortunately it builds a narrative that is not true so what the chief had to say was based upon his emotion and based upon what he had heard and what he had seen but i would like to invite him and anybody else who feel that way to really come to a table and talk to somebody from the movement listen to their pain listen to their fears the police chief didn't want to speak on camera about the post and has since taken it down but says he was encouraged to hear what these faith leaders have to say Voting during a pandemic, what the state is doing to make sure tomorrow's primary is safe for voters. Hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only.
We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. Congressional Democrats introduced legislation today to reform policing in America as President Trump is stressing law and order and sharply opposing calls to take funding away from police departments. Ellis Barr in Washington has the very latest. On Capitol Hill today, Democrats from the House and Senate kneeling silently for eight minutes and 46 seconds, the length of time a Minneapolis police officer pinned George Floyd's neck under his knee. Lawmakers then unveiling new police reform legislation, including bans on chokeholds and no-knock warrants, and a national database to track police misconduct. We are here today in search of that vision, liberty, and justice for all. At the White House, where a newly constructed fence has become a canvas for memorials to George Floyd, President Trump huddling with law enforcement leaders today and tweeting law and order, not defund and abolish the police. You eliminate police officers, um, you will have chaos, crime, and anarchy in the streets, and that's something that's unacceptable to the president. <laughs> Defunding and disbanding police agencies became a rallying cry of protesters nationwide. Now a majority of the Minneapolis City Council is pledging to dismantle its police department and recreate public safety systems, while the mayor of New York vows to cut NYPD funding for the first time and redirect that money to other community resources. We've got work to do. There's no question. Seattle's police chief supports more funding for social services, but stresses police will always be needed. Who's going to take the calls of domestic violence, uh, internet crimes against children, rape, 
robbery, vandalism. Calls for justice now shifting to practical policy change as leaders try to come to grips with a systemic struggle that spanned generations. Police officers have been swiftly fired and charged in recent accusations of excessive force. Now some protesters are asking when we will see movement in the Jamari and Robinson shooting from 2016. Robinson shot 59 times, according to the medical examiner, as a federal task force attempted to arrest him inside an East Point apartment. Today, a group marched from Centennial Olympic Park to the Fulton County Jail over what they are calling a continuing failure to the district attorney, Paul Howard, to charge anyone. The task force was made up of local law enforcement and at least one U.S. Marshal. Fulton County D.A. Paul Howard, as seen here, announced plans to bring a case before the grand jury last year, but that has not happened. Mr. Howard sued the Department of Justice, claiming the agency is blocking his efforts to investigate further. One of the messages of the protests is vote. Georgia Congressman John Lewis reinforcing that message. He was an integral part of the civil rights movement, one of the most famous men in America in the 20th century. And of course, I don't need to give you a lesson on what he has accomplished in his remarkable life. He today appeared on Ellen and he talked about the power of every vote. Well, it is my hope that what has taken place during the past few days would inspire all of us to get out there and vote like we never voted before. We have to do it. We must do it just to help save America and maybe help save the planet. Good to see Congressman Lewis. He has been battling pancreatic cancer over the last few months, and he says he is happy that the world is expressing freedom of speech and continuing the push for equality for everybody. We talked with Mayor Bottoms today, and she says that we are seeing a new generation of activists emerge, and when she sees the peaceful protests, she is reminded of the civil rights marches of the 1960s. She hopes the momentum will carry through to voter turnout and that the state will work out issues related to the pandemic, like the long early voting lines. We're going to see a lot of people turning out to vote, and it's going to be unacceptable for people to have to stand in line for six to eight hours like we saw in some Fulton County precinct. So hopefully the lessons from this election, um, we can tweak, or Fulton County and, and the various counties can tweak what needs to be done going into the November election, but I think that people are motivated, and I, and I certainly think that's gonna carry over past tomorrow. Mayor Bottoms says the big question is, where do we go from here? She says police reform is one part of the solution. The mayor created a commission to look at the use of force, and uh, Cheryl Preheim asked her about the idea of defunding police departments. A very simplified message is defund the police. But I think the, the overarching theme is that people want to see a reallocation of resources into community development and alternatives to just criminalizing um, responses to behavior. The mayor points out how the city has to cut its corrections budget by 60 percent and are allow, okay, uh, allocating that the funding to convert the Atlanta Detention Center into a health and wellness center. <laughs> Talked about reports that the mayor is among those running for or may be included with uh, Joe Biden on the ticket. 11alive.com, the place for you to check out that interview that Cheryl did earlier this afternoon with Mayor Bottoms. Voters will head to the polls for Georgia's long delayed primary tomorrow, but voting during a pandemic can be a challenge. Emory University is offering three tips to reduce your chances of being exposed to coronavirus at the polls. Here's Latasha Givens. During a video briefing, infectious disease physician Dr. Mary Beth Sexton with Emory University gave several tips on how to protect yourself at the poll. She says social distancing is your first line of defense. Because you do want to try to come as close to, as possible to that six foot distance between people in line. Your second layer of protection, your mask. The mask you've got on probably does protect you a little bit, but mostly it protects everyone around you in line and then everyone else's mask does the same thing for you. Third, bring your own pen and hand sanitizer with you. If you think you're gonna need a pen to fill out any form, bring your own so that you don't have to touch one that a bunch of other people have touched as well. Bring hand sanitizer with you, and if you do have to touch any common touch surfaces like the table or like a pen, and certainly the voting machines themselves, 
Sanitize your hands immediately after and don't touch your face. Dr. Sexton also says if possible, try to vote during less crowded times if you can. Dr. Sexton also says if you voted at a polling location that was very crowded and COVID-19 guidelines were not followed, it is best to get a test a few days later. And for everything else you need to know for tomorrow's elections, head to our website at 11alive.com. The field operations were suspended due to the coronavirus pandemic. Field activities are back in almost every census office statewide. Staffers are told to practice social distancing and to wear protective equipment. Former President George W. Bush will not support President Trump's re-election. That's according to sources within the New York Times. They reported over the weekend. For what it is worth, neither Mr. Bush nor his wife voted for uh, President Trump or Hillary Rodham Clinton in 2016, choosing instead to vote for down-ballot candidates. The New York Times reports that Republican Senator Mitt Romney of Utah also says he will not back the president, as was the case in 2016. The death of George Floyd in Minneapolis has triggered protests across the world. Demonstrators have called for justice in his case and for stamping out racism and police brutality in their own countries. Here's NBC's Molly Hunter. Now, the first big solidarity Black Lives Matter protest we saw here in London was a week ago on Sunday. There was another big one on Wednesday in Hyde Park. And since then, we've seen them pop up all over Europe, all over the world, really. Tens of thousands of people out showing solidarity. Now, take a listen to some of the protesters in their words about why they're out on the streets, why the U.S. protest resonates so strongly. This has been happening for years. It's time to stop. We're finished. We're here to protest to say to, that we need to end the racism just today. We have suffered too long in America, and we suffered too long in Britain with racist policing and killer police. Now, the protests here in the UK, largely peaceful. There was a slight incident in front of 10 Downing, the prime minister's residence here in London, a little bit of a skirmish. And over the weekend, a monument in Bristol, it's a city just to the west of here, was actually torn down. It was a guy named Edward Colston, a slave trader from the late 1600s. And that statue was actually dumped in the harbor. The health secretary here has warned protesters, though, of course, that coronavirus is still going. We are still in the middle of a pandemic, so he has warned them, please be careful. Uh, of course, something we're talking about both in the States and over here in the UK. Tonight, a reveal investigation into a candidate running for Superior Court judge once fired from the bench before. Tiffany Sellers on tomorrow's ballot for Fulton County Superior Court judge. About two years ago, she served as the city of South Fulton's first magistrate court judge. At that time, it was the first judicial system in the country run by African-American women. That picture went viral. But Sellers fired from her job about a year later. Reveal investigator Andy Parati uncovered a long list of people who claim the judicial candidate didn't pay her debts in the past. Sure, people make one or two mistakes in their past. But when you've got 10 plus lawsuits and things like that against you, I think you need to get your own house in order before you try to get a job, the job as a judge in a courthouse. I respectfully disagree. You know, I think what we need are we need judges who've lived life. You can hear more from Ms. Sellers and why she believes her legal problems make her the better candidate for the job. That is tonight at 11 Alive at 11 on Update, about 21 minutes away. Chris. We've been tracking a few scattered showers that have been moving through coming in from the south to the north. That's rotating around this uh, tropical depression, Cristobal. Stay with us. We're going to have even more moisture heading our way tomorrow. We'll talk about an increase in rain chances and when we'll even see a higher chance for stronger storms. Coming up, more leagues speaking up against racial injustice. We speak with one former college football player about how the sports community can continue to do more. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. 
We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. More than 7 million people around the world have now tested positive for COVID-19. 400,000 people have died as a result. In Georgia, the number of cases hit more than 52,000 today with 2,208 lives lost. We have asked all the time to flip the data and report how many people have recovered. The problem is that data is not tracked, but investigative reporter Rebecca Lindstrom has new perspective that may help. I am always asking for more data and more insight on the data that already exists. In one of my open records requests, I received a county breakdown of the number of people who had died at the hospital with COVID-19. The report was generated on May 29th. At the time, there had been about 7,700 hospitalizations. 19% of those patients, 1,446 mothers, fathers, sons and daughters had died. On that same day, Georgia Emergency Management reported 891 active patients. So if you subtract out both of those groups, you end up with 5,397. That number represents recoveries. The number of people who were the most ill went to the hospital for treatment and then went home. This weekend, a nurse reached out to us after she noticed the number of fatalities reported on DPH's daily status report dropped by 14 people. She wanted to know how that was possible. We noticed it too. We track this and dozens of other metrics every day and notice adjustments all of the time. Usually it's a case that gets moved back in time or attributed to another county as DPH learns more. This time a DPH spokesperson says their quality control team found duplicates. In a written statement, she said, we can get the same death reported by more than one source, or sometimes it's a name that was misspelled and resubmitted without being identified as a correction. Many are simply clerical errors. 
There are a lot of decisions being made using this data, and as frustrated as we get with it, national groups like COVIDTracking.com give Georgia an A for data quality. They say fixing mistakes like this when they're caught is one reason why. We continue to track some showers that have been moving through the area. We had one with some really heavy rain that went right over the city, pretty much went from south to north on the downtown connector, and then it moved through the northern parts of Atlanta. It has crossed over the north end of the perimeter there at Sandy Springs and is now moving on up to the north end of North Fulton, but it's a lot weaker than it was earlier. It had heavy rain inside the perimeter. We even had one lightning strike here. It was never severe or anything, but just some really heavy rain with that. And now it's diminishing as it moves up toward the north. We've also been tracking some heavier showers back into Alabama that have been right here, uh, right over the line from, uh, from Georgia into Alabama. Alabama and Cleburne County. You had some heavier rain earlier with thunder and lightning. I had some uh, comments on my Facebook live from folks out in Bowden, Georgia and West Georgia saying they were hearing the thunder from those storms in Alabama. And some of those went up toward Rome earlier with a little thunder and lightning in western parts of Floyd County. But the trend is that all of those showers and storms have been diminishing. Also, we had some heavier rain earlier around Lake Oconee that moved up near Athens. That's all gone now. And then these bands of heavier rain, these have been a little stronger and have been producing severe weather back in Alabama. Now, as these are moving to the north, though, we're not really watching this rain in Alabama moving our way. It's moving this way, and the trend is as it tries to get closer to the Georgia line, it kind of starts to die out somewhat. And then strong storms still in Mississippi. All of this is coming around what is left of Tropical Depression Cristobal, uh, which is an area of low pressure with a counterclockwise flow. And you have that really tropical rich moisture over to the west in Mississippi, also in Alabama and into Arkansas. Those orange colors here indicate the very moist air. We have also had really humid conditions here in our area today, and that helped to kick off some scattered showers. This tropical rich moisture is going to be with us again tomorrow, and our rain chances are even going to go up a little bit. And then on Wednesday, not only is our air mass here still very humid and moist, We'll have scattered showers with that, but we have an approaching cold front that's going to move our way, and that's going to be another ingredient to maybe increase our chances for some stronger storms uh, during the day on Wednesday. We do have a chance for maybe a few uh, isolated severe storms, but then look what happens. As that front moves through, it pushes all the rain and all that moisture down to the south and the rain chances go away. But then it also is some very dry air with the purple and blue colors, meaning the relative humidity levels are going to go down and that dry air is going to stick with us not only for the end of the week, but also into the weekend too. So it looks like it's going to be rain free. So it's been so humid the past few days and it's going to be humid at least through Wednesday. And then when that front passes through, look what happens. The dew points move into the 50s, not the temperatures, but the dew points are in the 50s and that's going to be really dry air over us. So for Tuesday, still very humid. We're going to have scattered showers, a high of 87. That'll be a five on the wasometer. The wasometer goes down to a four on Wednesday uh, with a better chance for showers, maybe even some stronger storms at times with highs near 86. And then here comes the drier air. We're clearing out Thursday, highs near 85. Dry Friday, Saturday and Sunday, meaning no rain and lower humidity. A few more clouds will start to build in Monday with high temperatures around 86. Atlanta United held its first full squad workout today. The team was able to play some 11 on 11 scrimmages. Meanwhile, all the safety precautions such as frequent testing are still in place. More on that in a moment, but a lot of leagues all around America right now are now talking about racial injustice, speaking out, trying to continue the fight institutionally. Alex Glaze spoke with a former college football player, Forrest Connolly, about how sports can do more than it's ever done before. NFL players released a video and spelled out exactly what they wanted to hear from the league when it comes to matters of race and police brutality. And the league responded in less than 24 hours. So my question to you, Forrest, is what did you think of the player's statement and what did you think of the NFL's response? I think all of these players are in right now. Everybody's in because they understand this is a problem that has to discontinue. It has to stop. The influence of sports, it, it, it's such a, a big, big issue. So when these guys step up to the plate, people start to listen. And then also, I, I hear people now talking about, okay, well, what about Kaepernick? I want him to get a job working for the NFL, being the person that institutes this change. 
He started this. I think he needs to be sitting down with Goodell every day talking about what's the plan for today. And Sunday, we also saw NASCAR drivers and the president of NASCAR make their voices heard on these matters as well, denouncing racism. And for a sport that for a long time has had that stigma of racism attached to it, what does that tell you about where NASCAR is hoping to be? Well, I think NASCAR is all in. Everybody's all in right now. It's easy to hop in now, but we'll know if it's real by the people that stay in. And we'll know it's real by your actions. You know, they always say you can show me better than you can tell me. Now, everybody's told us. Now it's time to show us. Alex Glaze reporting for us. All right. As I previously reported, <laughs> Atlanta United held its first full squad workout. I've heard this before. The team was able to play some 11 on 11, and I stumbled over that the first time too, 11 on 11 scrimmages. Meanwhile, all the safety precautions such as frequent testing in play, place, the team is now preparing for a tournament in Orlando that will take place next month. Defender Miles Robinson said it won't take the team too long to refine their chemistry. We need a, a, you know, some fitness, some level of fitness, um, and we can get that over the next few weeks. But uh, come uh, July or whenever our first game is, we'll definitely be ready. It's just a matter of uh, focusing in on ourselves and uh, competing and training every day. And if we do that, I think we'll be very successful. All right, so those guys are back today. Coaches return to NFL facilities, and the league sent out a memo about players returning soon as well. And finally, the Georgia Bulldogs and the rest of the SEC return to work. Our UGA insider, Roddy Nabulsi, giving us details on the dogs getting back to work. I'm standing in front of the University of Georgia Bulldogs football facility, a facility that has not been used for months. Since March, none of the Georgia players have been allowed inside, but that changed this morning. June 8th, the SEC, the NCAA allowed players to voluntarily arrive on campus and work out with their teammates. Uh, there are coaches involved to make sure that any of the guys using the, the workout equipment are uh, doing so safely, but the coaches are not allowed to have practices yet. That's coming down the road. They, these are voluntary. The players do not have to be here, but we did find out that every freshman in Georgia's number one signing class has arrived. We're looking at 100% participation from the Georgia Bulldogs inside, mainly because Kirby Smart has recruited at such a high rate over the past four years that if you want to keep your spot or you want to earn a spot, you need to be here. So there are a lot of guys in there who are either coming back, trying to earn a spot for the first time or maintain the spot that they have now. All right. Good stuff, Roddy. Thanks. Uh, a lot of high schools welcoming back athletes today for voluntary workouts. Everybody now taking the safety regulations seriously. But the good news is it looks like sports is coming back. Yes. All right. We'll take a break. We're coming back to this message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear, on 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are... And that is it for us tonight on this Monday. Thank you for watching. We appreciate it. We will see you here tomorrow night. Switch over to 11 Alive right now. Ron Jones has you covered on Up Late on 11 Alive. For the team, I'm Jeff Hollinger. Good night. And this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.